just because it's right before the time to start. So I wanted to say um, that we are now live. So if you wanted to know that. So you guys are recording right. on your end, right? Yes. Oh, well, yes. we have a couple participants that just joined already. Like the Wonderful. room here on time. Look, look at this. We've got attendees joining already. Perfect. Perfect. Well, I like to um, just give about five minutes. Um, it looks like Dr. Gilpin is in his office today. I I'm am. in my office, um, changed up the scenery today. And Dr. Carniel is with little David <laughs> today. I actually was in the office earlier today. I was in the operating yeah. room, back in the office, finishing up some paperwork yeah. and then made it home. Oh, nice. Yeah. I saw the picture that looked great. Yeah. Okay. So we're going to just wait till five minutes after the hour. I usually like to wait to allow everybody to join in because sometimes it's just a reminder. And then they're like, oh, shoot. Okay. Yes. I have to um, figure out how to get on. And it's a little yes. loading process sometimes. So I'm going to wait for people to get all on right now. Um, and before we start, um, just wanted to kind of introduce my two guests, <laughs> Dr. David Gilpin yes. and Dr. Eric Carniel. Dr. Eric Carniel has joined me before, so he is a recurring uh, favorite. <laughs> and uh, Dr. Gilpin, this is his first time. So I was trying right. to convince Dr. David Gilpin to join me because um, he's been a very big uh, person on IG Live. And I just said, you know what? I've done that before. I'm moving on to bigger things. Um, IG Live is great. It's a great platform. Uh, but I think that this platform allows us to really do it in a more professional, educational manner, which I think my patients appreciate. So I have a practice that I gear towards um, patients who come in and want to know a lot of information. So I take the time to spend with them when I discuss any procedure. So that's what they appreciate. And a lot of people find me through looking at my YouTube gallery, my YouTube channel. Today, this is not going on YouTube Live, although the last time I did, because I was having some little, uh, what do you call it, uh, technical difficulties with Facebook. Um, and I know Facebook is doing their own sort of live um, chat or whatever thing as well now. But I was able to get it to go live today. But um, I do see a couple of people have now joined in. And so why don't I just go ahead and allow Dr. David Gilpin to give a little introduction. Sure, thank yeah. you. No, and um, no, thank you so much, uh, Christina, for uh, having me today. This is wonderful. Um, hopefully you didn't have to convince me too much, no. It was a, it was a pleasure to uh, be invited. Um, I and I'll I've got a little slide here that introduces me. I'll skip over that one. I'm um, based here in Nashville, Tennessee. Um, I'm a facial plastic and reconstructive surgeon, and uh, did my training um, down with Dr. Calvin Johnson in New Orleans, and uh, where got did my fellowship with him and um, went uh, up to Case Western for my residency. So I am a, um, just like Dr. Tanzavati, like Dr. Carniol, I am a cosmetic facial plastic surgeon. Also do some uh, reconstruction, a little bit. I also do a little bit of uh, facial trauma as well. I think that's, that's a really um, great thing we, we do as well here at one of our um, trauma centers here in Nashville. So. Um, I'm glad to do that as well. Yeah, and that probably gives you a lot of uh, interesting anatomy. Oh yes, particularly when it pertains to faceless and necklace. So, oh absolutely. Uh, so, I do want to say some. Uh, I'm gonna say a hi out to some people that I have seen on Instagram. So I'm so glad to see them here as well. So I didn't know if everybody would be able to make the transition from a different platform. But I do want to say hi out to those who have just joined. All right, so now it's Dr. Eric Carniel's turn with little David in his arm. We'll see how well he does uh, introducing himself without all the noise. Yeah. Sounds good. 
Sounds good. Well, thank you very much, Christina, for having me on again. Uh, my name is Dr. Eric Carneal. I'm also a facial plastic surgeon, uh, and I do about 50% uh, cosmetic and uh, an aesthetic practice, including facelifts. And we talked uh, last week just about hair loss, which is fantastic. And now it's uh, a pleasure to be here again talking about uh, facelift. Um, this week as well, uh, I've even gotten to do some reconstructive surgery uh, as uh, thankfully things are getting a little bit better in New Jersey. Uh, so that's a nice thing. So I was able to do my first uh, case in the hospital uh, as of, uh, oh, thank you. Oh, my wife just arrived. And so I get to hand off the baby. Thank you. Um, <laughs> and so I was able to do my uh, first case in the operating room in quite a while. So it uh, yeah. felt like riding a good old bicycle. So that was uh, fantastic. Great. All right. Oh, we have uh, another person joining here. Um, <laughs> so anyways, a um, little bit about myself. I'm, hi, I'm Dr. Christina Tanzavati, and I'm a, also a facial plastic surgeon, double board certified here in Westlake Village, California. I'm joined by two great colleagues that have joined me on the national stage at the podiums at our meetings. Um, so I have very, very uh, well-established facial plastic surgeons talking with me today and talking about our experience with uh, facial uh, facelifts and neck lift procedures. Today, I changed the scenery up a little bit. So I know you have seen me at home, but today I'm at my office only because I'm not seeing any patients today and I'm, I've not been seeing anybody in the office for a little bit of time now. I'm doing mostly virtual uh, consultations but uh, I still see post-ops from time to time. I haven't seen some recently, but what I'm doing here today is trying to set up our office for success when we do reopen. And I know it's gonna be a gradual process. It's not gonna be a light switch, but I um, am trying to keep the office as safe for all of my patients when they return. So we are walking through the office and trying to make sure we've got all the necessary supplies. I think there's a shortage around the country and I'm sure David and Eric can attest to the fact that PPEs are in shortage, but even though we have bypassed a lot of the surge already, the PPEs are being hoarded by the hospitals and our uh, president for our um, you know, stockpile. So that makes it very hard for doctors to get back into the office because we still need a PPE to see our patients, particularly also dentists because they're right in the face. And I see my colleague, Dr. Soremi is on. So I, I want to just acknowledge that uh, that is something that we're all facing, trying to get enough uh, protective equipment for ourselves. But today let's have a lighter air. Uh, you know, we have to create those sort of protocols and logistics on how we can get back into the hospital in a safe manner. And when we do so, we will be back doing facelifts and neck lifts when it's safe. But we're excited to be out talking about this procedure with all of you today. And we put together a great presentation, I think, uh, from all of us combined to showcase what we can do with a facelift and neck lift that doesn't have to look over pulled. We have, I, I put together a, a couple of um, actors and don't take this by any means to mean that we are saying, oh wow, they had horrible plastic surgery. I'm not going to you know, name um, surgeons or anything that's of that sort. We're just pointing out these pictures as an example of what is actually not the common but we see them and because they're such big names, people want to think that that's what we see with all facelifts. And that's just not true, simply not true. So today we're trying to dispel those myths and uh, we'll start off with going over markers of youth and then we'll um, kind of highlight what a youthful male face looks like and a youthful female face. Um, I think that's important to see both. So uh, Dr. Carnell has put some information together and I put some as well just to, to complement that. And then after that, Dr. Gilpin will go over two myths and showcase how that's not true with his own cases. And then I'll go over two myths as well. And we'll save the questions towards the end. For those who have just joined, if you want to know, you can go ahead and put your questions in the Q&A box and that will be visible though to 
to other people as well. If you want to be anonymous, you can do so through the chat function. That chat function just gets sent to us, the panelists, and then we'll have some polling um, kind of interspersed with this, uh, this scheduled presentation. So with that being said, let's start off with Dr. Carniel. He'll start off with going a little bit and uh, share his screen. Can you share your screen there? I hope I yes. open it up for you. Uh, let me, uh, perfect. All right. So I just wanted to, you know, at first, uh, perfect. That'll be once I set that up. Uh, so in terms of, you know, the what occurs with facial aging, we all know in terms of that youthful, first the, the baby look, as, as uh, my son was exemplifying excellent. He's excellent at his daytime uh, skincare routine and, and up to date with everything there. Uh, but we know as well that youth has these wonderful cheekbones uh, that start to decline. We know as well that the wonderful jawline as well. We know all the, the, the great brow uh, and as well, wonderful skin. Uh, and so over time, there are multiple things that happen with the aging process. Uh, and so now we'll just set up uh, a little bit of, you know, the things that happen with aging. And you can see the screen okay? Mm -hmm. yes, sir. Perfect. Um, and I'll just play this. So in terms of, you know, what happens with aging? Well, really three things happen all at once. The first is that we lose volume. And we have this great volume in terms of uh, all of the great structures in our face. Over time, those tissues start to sag. Uh, and then as, as well, we get some uh, skin damage. And so it's important to look at all of these uh, functions from all of the different layers of the face. And all of this is what a facial plastic surgeon looks at when they see a patient in the office and tries to figure out exactly, well, what does this patient need to restore that rejuvenated look, to get them back to feeling that self-confidence uh, that they had in their youth? Uh, and so, you know, the first thing that we talk about is losing volume. And we lose volume in all of our layers of the face. And that's literally from our bones to our fat, our muscles, our soft tissue, our skin uh, tends to thin out. These are all of the things. And so, you know, it, it's tough to sound, sometimes describe how exactly this occurs we're losing volume. Um, so it just puts together uh, a little kind of side by side of a, a CAT scan of a face. Um, and you can see that on the, um, your, uh, left side uh, or the anatomic right side is a nice youthful brow, uh, a nice youthful skull. And so what you see is, you know, even in that upper brow ridge, you see some wonderful prominence that then starts to flatten out as the patient ages. And so the, the on the left is somewhere uh, that's much more youthful. And then uh, on the other side is much, someone much more in their 70s. And so you see that brow ridge starts to come down. One of the reasons why we lose that wonderful brow tail. As well, our eyes change in shape. And so that's why we start to see that, that fat that starts to come out. And so that's where we talk about eyelid lifts um, because mm -hmm. that changing of shape is just so important. When we go down to the cheek itself, we even notice that the cheek bones are not where they used to be. They're lower, as you can see here. Um, and as well, it's not as prominent. So not just lower, but flatter. And so we're losing that beautiful, youthful cheek. And then we look at this area. Uh, and what we notice on the youthful side is that it's nice and full. But on the more aged side, there's definitely a depression uh, that we notice. Uh, and that's that resorption of bone. As well, you take a look at that kind of black line in the center is where the nose bones are uh, and where it meets the cheek. And you notice even that that opens up. And so all of these different pieces are changing shape. The same thing with the jawbone. We all lose some of that wonderful jaw youthfulness. Uh, and so we're losing that good support, but then tissues start to sag down. And this is really one of the things that, you know, facelift and, uh, is, is so wonderful. And we'll talk about restoring some of that volume as well when we talk about facelift. But this sagging of tissues, we, all the collagen, the elastic fibers that you read about supplements, all those start to stretch and you lose all that good strength. And so, yes, it's another reason why things start to sag. Uh, and so in the face itself, we have multiple different kind of fat pads. Uh, and so they start to come in. 
And so as they descend, they're not just falling down straight, but they kind of fall inwards, almost towards the chin itself. So it's that down and inward descent that leads to those kind of heavy folds, uh, what we call the nasal labial folds, that cheek fold, and as well that jowl, uh, which becomes you know really tough. That's a, if you look on the uh, one side, it's F and G are those where that jowl starts to come in. And the third thing we talked about is that skin damage, that sunlight, UV damage, even other spectrums of light. I know Dr. Tentavati had a great talk a couple weeks ago uh, with you about uh, blue light, even a uh, physical trauma as well. We have this wear and tear on our bodies uh, that we all go through. Uh, and so I just, in uh, a couple pictures, you can see kind of changes in youth. Uh, and so you start to see those tissues, loss of support. These are just great uh, drawings, but uh, you can definitely see it here. Uh, changes in youth where that high, wonderful cheekbone starts to get lost. Those cheeks start to come down. That fold starts to thicken. Uh, those jowls start to form and that we lose that volume in the neck. And so you get that, uh, you know, tightness uh, along those muscle bands that start to develop. So these are all of the different pieces that we get to talk about a little bit uh, with face lift and we'll go through kind of the techniques and uh, so uh, these are Thank all the you. things there. Oh my gosh, Dr. Carnell, that was such a great presentation. <laughs> that was excellent. And that picture, the only um, a little side note on that picture was drawn so well except the brow did not change shape through the whole. Um, yeah, I agree. No, the, the, yeah. the brow progression just was, you yeah. know, it's wonderful, yeah, I didn't but. Uh, brow draw it, now, which I was like, ah, well, she still has really <laughs> nice looking brows. <laughs> she does. <laughs> All right. So that's good. Yes. Yeah. Let me, um, uh, do, before we move forward with going over the myths, I'm going to just showcase just a couple pictures to myself because I thought. What better, I know those are great pictures that are drawings, but sometimes our eyes can really understand it when we look at people's faces that we know, that we're familiar with. So I'm gonna go ahead and just share my screen if that's okay with you guys. Um, so here I am on mine and I'm gonna showcase this. So markers of a youth, I decided to choose Chris Hemsworth because I love his face. Sorry, sorry guys. <laughs> but <laughs> um, I mean, his cheekbones and where they're set. I mean, on a male face, we kind of look at the difference between a male face and a female. I know we you pointed out some of the underlying structure, but I'm gonna also take a look at what's the distinction between a male face and a female face because there are still men who want to get a facelift. I'm just going to tell you right there that I do do some male facelifts as well. Um, again, it's still more females, more women coming out uh, and reaching out to us for facelifts. But the jawline you can see is so distinctive there. It's so chiseled on him as well as his cheeks. They're not like apples though. They're not, you know, with a woman's cheekbone, I'm going to point to myself, I'm pointing on myself here, our cheekbones a little higher and further out, but you don't see that with him, but you see the width of the face and a more angular face. Um, then I want to go to the, this picture and this is not a play on his age or how he's aging. This is meant to just demonstrate he was a good looking guy. He is still good looking. I'm not saying he's not. I'm just pointing out here the changes that we're noticing in his face. If you look around the lower face, what has happened is it was well proportioned when he was younger. Upper and lower were about the same width. Now what we see as he has aged is you've got this sagging in the lower face and heaviness below the jawline. So we're seeing all these curves that are not were not there when he was younger and all those folds are creating that um, aged look. Um, you're also seeing a deflation in the cheeks. So if you see where he was <laughs> in his youth, these cheeks up here versus now, as what Dr. Carniel pointed out, it has sagged to this inner portion right here. Either way though, he had always had folds and I'm gonna point now a female face. This is, um, I am a big Star Wars fan, so sorry, I had to put this in, but um, beautiful cheekbones starting off, you know, she still had great cheekbones even in her older age, 
but you could see what we talked about with the brow, how it descends down, you know. Here was, uh, you can't quite see it here, but it was the same actually height and it has descended down as she's gone older, okay? That was the bony structure support that had lost volume on the outsides and it causes this deflation and everything falling down on the outsides. So the outsides fall down. Same thing with here, she had great volume here and descended into and what creates these folds. So this heaviness down here, as well as then along the jawline, it was smooth and now she's got the jowls here, okay? So I chose these um, pictures only because I wanted to show those who have not had plastic surgery and they look just fine. They look just fine. I'm not saying that they don't, um, they haven't aged well. My point is they look natural. Now we're gonna show you what a facelift can do that is also still natural and doesn't look uh, over pulled or whatever the myths that we have. We're gonna dispel those today. So with that, Dr. Gilpin, I'm turning it over to you. Oh, wow, okay. Well, thank you, Christine. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Carnell. That was a great, um, that was a great introduction. Um, so yeah, what we'll do, we'll kind of jump in there. Let me do, let me share my screen. Or hang on, yeah, let's do that. Um, where, there it is right there. Yeah, I want to do that first. And we're going to share that. And then, Let's see if we did that. Okay, we did that. Um, okay, yes. Yeah, so um, I think that that Christina, Dr. Tanzavati, has done a great has put a uh, great um, concept for this presentation with the, the the myths and then the markers of youth because there are a lot of myths out there and we really want to um, dispel those today. So and like Dr. Tanzavati said, we're not we're not here to you know badmouth. Or, or disparage any surgery that's out there, but it is what you and our uh, and our patients are seeing. So we need to we need to dispel those myths, get get the good information out there, so you'll know what it is, <clears throat> what it is that that uh, that we do, and that that what you're what you're looking at when when considering, you know, facial rejuvenation uh, procedures. So kind of what I was thinking about, and I discussed this with my staff as well, um, kind of thinking about two myths that folks think about when they're thinking about having, say, a facelift or a neck lift. And then the first one is, is that really facelifts, neck lifts are really only for older folks. We're not gonna have that um, surgery uh, until later in life, okay? And that, um, uh, you know, I just need to wait a few, just a few more years. Okay. So why is that? Well, for, uh, their friends, their family have had surgery later in life. They waited, um, you know, a few years later, the mainstream media, we're going to take a look at a few examples here in just a second that show folks older in life, having these procedures. A lot of folks just say, you know, when I'm older, I'm just going to have more time. And it's just, a, it's just what I, what I want to do. Um, also we hear, you know, well, my friends will say, you know, if I, if I, if I do it now and not wait till I'm younger, they're just going to say um, I'm vain. That that you know, why would you want to do that right now? We're going to talk about that as well. Um, so here's an example. It's a little blurry, and and actually, I'm not saying anything about Miss um, Fonda's facelift. It actually there, there's some there's some great qualities to it, but you know, someone in kind of that we think about you know having a facelift later in life as I as I think about her. Um, there. So we see this in the mainstream media. Of course, Joan Rivers. Now with her, <clears throat> of course, I mean, she's kind of, I don't know if y'all can, can y'all see my, my arrow um, on the screen there, Christina? Mm -hmm. um, sorry. Um, let me, let me kind of show you just, just, well, just a few things here. We don't have to, we don't have to take too long on this, but um, well, I tell you, we're going to, we'll, we'll come back to that kind of pointing out a few things about her facelift, but essentially she's, she's always had a lot of work or always had a lot of work done uh, throughout her life. Now, Dr. Carniel's already, already covered a lot of this. I'm not going to belabor it. Um, as we age, our, 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 as he described, our face will sag and comes towards the center. So it makes sense that we would want to do these procedures later in life and, and, and we should. Okay. Um, but some of the truths behind, um, you know, having a 
having the benefits of being a little younger when you have your facelift, one of, one of the things we kind of ask our, gently ask our patients is why, why do you want to wait? This is, this is a procedure that you can enjoy while you're younger. You don't have to wait until you're older. So patients will just say, you know, I should just wait a few more years. Something else where we try to tell folks is you're, you're not going to get any younger, okay? And you're also not going to get any healthier. So folks say, I want to wait five years. Okay, well, the, the tissue here is not going to restore itself back uh, back up. I forget, y'all can't see me. I'm demonstrating on my face, but you can't see me. No, we can see you. We can oh, see you can. Okay, never mind. Um, your skin is healthier and has more elasticity, just like Dr. Carnell always said, okay? The better your skin quality, the better your outcome of your, of your facelift every time, okay? And I'm gonna show you some examples of this um, as well. You're gonna be able to enjoy your results a lot longer. Longer. Also, I personally believe that if you ever did need a touch-up procedure, um, I, I believe that, that you're, you're so much farther ahead of the curve for your touch-up later in life if you've had one now. Um, you know, I'll have more time. Like I always say, recovery from a well-executed facelift typically is gonna be around nine to 14 days, okay? So let's take a, a few look at some examples here. So here's a nice young lady. She's late 40s, um, early 50s, okay? Certainly not the youngest patient that I've ever done, but she, this was, she really wanted to uh, be able to enjoy her, um, her facelift. And some things I want you to notice, she doesn't look pulled, in my opinion, doesn't look pulled, doesn't look windswept. What we've really done is we've really taken care of that jawline, okay, right here, really smoothed out the mouth, and also taking care of the neck. Um, kind of this, kind of this waddle right there, really kind of pulled it back, and um, hopefully everyone can kind of see that. Yeah, um, beautiful result. Yeah. Oh, okay. Thank you. No, thank you very much. Um, this this next patient, I actually. Um, pulled off of um, one of our review websites. I think she's happy and that I just haven't been able to see her back for her for her after photos. So I apologize for the for the the difference in in the, the quality of the photos. But again, another younger patient can really kind of have a dramatic uh, result when um, when we do it um, um, at a younger age. And again, I apologize. You really, it's, it's tough to see, but hopefully you can see right there at the neck. She's got great skin quality. We were really able to help define her jawline, help define her neckline. And this is going to last her for, for years. And if she ever comes back to see me and needs a tuck up, we're going to be able to do that pretty easily. Um, again, just kind of looking here, you know, someone who's not, you know, young professional woman, um, really cleaning up that jawline there and her neck. Mm -hmm. um, take a look at it from the from the frontal view as well. Mm -hmm. um, she really her her main concern here really was in her her jaw and neckline, really kind of getting that smoothed out as well. Um, you can really see right right there as well. We'll kind of keep going. Um, this patient I like to show she was she was late forties. And what I hope everyone sees is I want you to take a look at her mid face right here. She really didn't, she really didn't have, she was young. She really didn't have a lot of jaw definition that she needed to have done. But part of the deep plane facelift, just like Dr. Carnell was saying, I want you to notice how her fat, her fat pad was, was elevated. She has no filler, no fat in those cheeks. This was all from a deep plane facelift. I know we're not getting into the nuances of deep plane and all the differences, but I think it really helped improve. Um, we improved her jawline. It was it wasn't horrible to, to start with. Okay, so kind of myth number two. How am I doing on time? We're doing good. Um, so the, kind of the myth number two. And we hear this a lot. A facelift's going to leave me scarred. It's going to leave me swollen. Okay. Again, where do we see this? Some celebrities in the mainstream stream, stream media, and and folks have seen family and friends with poor results. Okay. I'm kind of giving you a little teaser we actually all see very well executed facelifts all the time. We just didn't, we just didn't notice that's what we were looking at. Okay. And that's something that I always tell my patients, well, I don't, I, I don't want to face it because I don't want to look like I've had one. Well, that is the entire, that's the whole idea. And that's our goal as well. And just finally, sometimes surgery can really can, can sound intimidating. So we need to have a, uh, have a, you know, discussion about that. Okay. Unfortunately, you know, we do see some, some results like this in the mainstream media that, that give us pause, you know, what happened here? 
I would say a lot of, in, in this case, a lot of what happened here is not only from the, from the lift, but also from some, some overfilling of, of fat in the cheeks. I can also see some pull right here, a little over tightened there in the eyes. It's kind of pulling it back, something that we don't want to see, okay? Um, <clears throat> this has kind of been up in the, in the news just a little bit. Again, I'm not trying to disparage anything, but when seeing kind of a telltale sign um, of the incision around the ear, also pulling the tragus right here forward is a telltale sign of, of a facelift um, or one that, that we essentially, we don't wanna be able to notice that. We don't wanna be able to notice the redness around the ear, okay? Again, I won't belabor on this point. These are things we see, things that scare us off, okay? The truth is well-executed facelifts should always look natural. Um, it, they, they are surgery, okay? They are surgical procedures. However, the incision placement should be meticulous and it should never be noticeable, okay? Swelling, everyone is gonna have swelling. It's gonna vary from patient to patient. We have strategies to help reduce swelling, but that should all be resolved roughly within about four to six months. And that's an average, okay? I always say, and my, my, um, uh, my uh, mentor always would say, I want you to look good enough to go to a restaurant in about 10 to 14 days, okay? So let's just take another look. So now we've got, you know, someone who's a little bit on the older end of the spectrum. And she even came in and said, am I too old for a facelift? And I said, well, do you want one? And she said, absolutely. And she's one of my happiest patients that I've got. So I want you to notice just, so her incisions were placed around her ears. I want you to notice as we go through this, if you're noticing where I did the surgery and where I put my incisions, okay? Uh, we, we were aggressive with her, wasn't, wasn't too aggressive with her, but I think she had a really nice result and she's very happy with, um, sorry, with, with that there. Kind of moving along, someone here, um, again, really helped kind of smooth the jawline out there. And again, I want you to notice if you didn't know, if you didn't know which one was her before and which one was her after, if you'd be able to tell. And again, on these, this, these are just facelifts and neck lifts. I did not do uh, eyes on her. This nice young lady, we actually did um, full facial rejuvenation. We did um, take care of her brow, her eyes, and also, did, uh, also on her face, did her face and her neck lift. But again, hopefully you're noticing a much smoother jawline and a much smoother neck. Excuse me, I'm hitting the button too fast there. Um, this last patient, someone I did years ago, she was a smoker, so I really didn't over tighten her too much as well. But again, kind of helping you notice, I want you to notice around the ears and just kind of rejuvenating around the mouth, around the jawline. Um, here's just a nice close-up picture of what the facelift incision will typically looks like around six weeks. It's still got a little bit of redness. This is in my hands. This is when I was doing, doing my incisions in front of the, the tragus. I now do it behind the tragus. I switched that up a little bit a few years ago. But, um, and here she is at six months post-operatively. Post and hopefully you, cannot, you won't be able to tell where that was. Um, and here's someone with outer makeup on this, one of the patients you saw before, one and a half most, months post-operative. The one before was about four to six months. So hopefully those kind of help dispel some of our myths. You don't have to, you do not look scarred. You do not look swollen. And we, you can get a really beautiful, nice result, even um, in our younger patients. So there you go. Thank you all. All right. Thank you, Dr. Gilpin. So before we move on, I would like to put a poll out there because I think this is, um, I think it's fun. So oh, yeah. I'm going to put a poll question here. You guys have not seen it yet. So I'm actually going to ask you guys to vote as well. Yeah. So the question is, you know, this is brought up with your first myth, which is um, about age and is, you know, in terms of Am I too young to have a face of? Am I too old to have a face of? So the question becomes, what is the appropriate age for a facelift? Okay, so 
So this is to be put out for all of you out there. I want you guys to qu to answer this because I really want to know what you think is an appropriate age, maybe for yourself or for um, from your experience seeing other people who have undergone a facelift. But what's the appropriate age for a facelift? And then I think we'll all answer this question, uh, Dr. Gilpin, Dr. Carniel, and myself. So I think that uh, it, it'd be interesting to see what you say, but I think we're all going to be on the same page. Yeah. So, um, so I will see what everybody answers. So I'm going to give you Dr. guys Gilpin, those were beautiful uh, before and afters. Oh, thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much. And also, we've got a few questions as well, but we'll get to those. We'll do a poll first. Sure. That'd be great. Oh, yeah. Okay, so I'm going to end the poll now. And I'm just going to share the results here. So a lot of you thought it depends. Um, some of you think 40 to 49. Some of you think 50 to 59. Some of you think older. And nobody thought above 70 should get a facelift, I assume, is what you're saying. So uh, what do you think, Dr. Gilpin? What would you say is the ideal age or the appropriate age for a facelift? I guess those two are different questions, ideal versus sure. appropriate. Well, absolutely. So I think that, so I'll, I'll answer it this way. Hopefully you kind of noticed from my, from my Ben, I do believe that the healthier, the healthier you are, the healthier your, your skin is, the better quality your skin is, the better your outcome, and we all we only want the best outcomes for for our our patients, of course. So, if in ideal age, I would say typically I'm, I'm not going to be doing a facelift. Um, I haven't done a facelift yet on anyone below 40, so I'm going to I'm going to say at least above 40, and I would say probably anywhere in the range of 40 um, to 55 is 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 really kind of an ideal age. You're healthy, you've got good skin quality. But again, it always goes back to, um, it depends. I think it's um, Dr. Dubrow on, um, on uh, Botched, he always, he's always said, if you can look in the mirror and you can lift your face, okay, and you can see an improvement. And folks, I've been doing the same thing with all these Zoom calls. I've been doing this all the time, okay? I could probably benefit from a face and neck lift. Okay, at least a facelift to help help this right there. If you can do that and you see improvement, you're you're most likely um, ready uh, for that procedure. Come in, we talk about it, and 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 go through everything. So that's kind of a long answer. Good answer. How about how about Dr. Carnell? What do you think? <laughs> I agree. I mean, it, it really does depend. And many of my patients kind of walk in and they go, "I'm I'm ready for a facelift," and I know instantly. When someone says, I'm ready for a facelift, they're ready. Um, and in my practice, it typically is patients that are kind of in their 50s, uh, usually or, or early 60s. Uh, just uh, many patients are that, that come in just may not be ready quite in their 40s, despite the fact that their skin and their tissues are ready. Um, so I would agree as well uh, that it's often, you know, patients, uh, as we say, will be a little bit behind in terms of yeah, it's it's really time. I'm overdue now, and that's usually in their you know, 50s to early 60s when that uh, when that really clicks in, and they say, you know what, I wish I had kind of come in a little bit earlier. Yeah, um, I think the general consensus is that we would say that it's better to come in earlier rather than wait too long. So I know people will put things behind. You know, it's 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 a scary thing to undergo a facelift, and then there's concerns with how you're going to heal, with how you, you might have visible incisions, or you might be over pulled. So, but from a surgeon's perspective, we always love dealing with younger patients, the better skin quality, the closures, the how everything heals, you're in better health, you're gonna recover better. Our older patients take a little bit longer to heal, longer to recover. So in the setting of a, for us as a surgeon, um, I would agree with Dr. Gilpin, age between 40 to 55, but everybody ages at their own rate. And some people who look 55 look like they're 40. And so I go, mm, yeah, you could have a facelift and you're a great time to have a facelift, but it's not like it's way out of the time frame because they still have great skin and they've been taking good care of themselves. So 
For this question, I would say it depends on the patient as well as what we see as in terms of our of the aging process. But I've never operated before 40, so. Oh. And, and Dr. Zantari, one thing that we notice is that aging is not a linear process. You know, the numbers keep going add on one by one. Um, right. But for many patients, they'll say, you know what, from 40 to 45, my skin, everything, my tissues, they looked great. But all of a sudden, you know, that 46 to 47 felt like another five years. Uh, and right. let's face it, in this crisis, I think we're all getting a little bit uh, extra aging uh, everywhere. Uh, oh, I so my bag we do, this morning. <laughs> so we do have that acceleration that occurs. I think at some point, uh, everyone reaches kind of their breaking point uh, in terms of their tissues. So it may be that, you know what, you weren't ready a year ago because your tissues weren't ready, but it's it's just all of a sudden those tissues start to turn. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So um, I have some questions that were uh, put on the chat window as well as the q and I'm just going to let you guys know both that who just posted. Thank you for submitting those. We'll answer them at the end. I have one, uh, two myths to go over and I'll keep it short and then we'll do one short poll and then we'll open it for the Q&A. Okay. So let me just share my screen and we'll go back to going over uh, the myths. All right, so this is the next myth, which is it can cause a stretching of the smile. I get patients who come in and ask me, is my smile going to change? I see this. I don't want this, okay? And I go, no. A, an actual facelift, the pull is not out to the side. The pull is actually in the upward direction. Yes, there's a little pull back, but it's really in a more vertical direction. We like to say 60 degrees if you're looking at a, <laughs> like a, in a mathematical sense, but there's an angle to it. It is not straight, you know, horizontal back. So that gives the stretched look to the smile. Um, so that is a picture of how he looks recently. Um, and I will show you uh, basically his his trajectory, right? So this is a good indication of, okay, what was his natural smile to begin with, right? Everybody can see that that smile looks unnatural because the smile should pull in an upward direction and it shouldn't go out horizontally. So you could see his smile is preserved into his, you know, 30s. And then when he got older with the over pull and possibly volume in the face, it caused that smile to get stretched. All right, so I'm gonna just share one picture of mine. I don't want to go too much. Um, I'm not gonna go, I'm gonna keep this as sure as possible. But if you look at her before and you look at her after, you'll see that the corner of her mouth did not change from before to after. That should not get pulled. And if, a, if that is pulled, it's because they're pulling too much actually on the skin and they're extending too much of the lift of the flap of the skin rather than going and doing a nice deep plane lift that Dr. Gilpin just mentioned earlier. So we both do a deep plane technique and we have some reasons behind that and we can go over that later. So again, this is from the side and if you just look at the corner of her mouth, you'll see that it has not changed from before to after, okay? So corner of the mouth will not be pulled out wider. That's a myth. Um, the, the smile will not be stretched. Okay, the fourth myth I'm going to present is an overpulled look. I know I'm pulling this, these pictures, they're all over the internet. I'm not trying to, you know, put something out there that nobody's talked about. I think his pictures have been circulating and you can see that his hairline looks a little bit distorted as well. His temporal tuft here has been changed. And there's a almost pulled look if you pull back what you can see in his face. And if you look at his earlobe very closely, you will see that it looks attached and lower. And that's a very clear sign that he had a facelift procedure, okay? So that again is when the procedure is done too much pulling on the skin, too much in a horizontal fashion. So not going to be um, a, we're not saying anything disparaging any of the surgical techniques out there. We're just saying what can be visually seen as a uh, uh, as a way of knowing that 
this patient, ha this person has had a facelift and how can we avoid it? Well, our, the way I avoid it is doing a deep plane technique. I love doing a deep plane technique because the tension is not on the skin. So you're not going to have a pull where the earlobe pulls down like that. You're also naturally lifting all the tissues that have descended. So when we do a deep plane, we're lifting all the fat components, the compartments that are that Dr. Carniel showed in a previous picture, and we're lifting all those back up to the right position. So that's what a deep plane will do. So this is a picture of one of my patients, a recent patient of mine, and you can see that the jawline is smooth. So literally this is a deep plane technique, but I did a modified technique. So that means I only address the lower face. You could address the neck by going all the way into the neck and doing more dissection, but her main goal was her lips. And she wanted at the same time, well, while I'm there, yes, I want to take care of my jawline. So we did that, shortened the procedure and did it in about a three hour procedure to do both a lip lift, placing the graft from the SMAS, which is the, the tissue that we lift with the deep plane, removing that muscle and using as graft that's well um, vascularized and it's their own, the patient's own material and it fills the lip in very naturally. So this is a not an overpulled look. You don't have to get a horizontal pull and it looks natural like she just was born with that jawline. Okay. So I'm going to end my screen here. And now we're going to go over the last poll question that I had. Um, so I'm going to allow the panelists to vote as well. What is holding you back from a facelift or neck lift surgery? If you've been considering having a facelift or neck lift surgery, what are some of the considerations for holding you back from getting that procedure done? So give us an idea on how to answer some of your questions out there as well. Those were also some beautiful before and afters. Yes, they were. Thank you, Iron. The lip lift was perfect as well. Oh, thank you. All right. So I'm going to give another 15 more seconds for the voting on this poll. And if you, you know, I'm not sure, you can always do the none of the above. I'm just here to learn. <laughs> All right, I'm gonna end the poll now. So, and I'm gonna share the results. So it kind of was all across the board. Mm -hmm. um, the one that had the highest number of um, people who answered was fear of complications. All right, so some people are not necessarily afraid of looking over pulled or distorted. They're afraid of complications and cost wasn't a major factor in um, people who answered or the lack of available downtime. It looks like mostly it was complications. So why don't we go over while we're still here to just answer what are potential complications because that is something I go over in detail when we do the preoperative, you know, as, you know, uh, visit, we'll go over the consent and it's a long process. So maybe one of the complications that uh, patients are most afraid of for you, Dr. Gilpin? Um, okay, so my patients, mainly my patients' um, fears um, are the fear of anesthesia. I'm, um, I, I know, but that's that's usually number one, then we get into other ones. So I'm just kind of cover that. Typically, facelift and neck lift, um, I do a lot of, of these procedures under a general anesthetic. It just keeps our patients more comfortable. It's more comfortable for them, more comfortable for me. It can also be done under a IV sedation um, with some local, and we can do that as well. But what I like, what I like to explain to my patients as far as anesthesia, if anesthesia is general anesthesia, okay, is a swimming pool, okay. If we are going to be doing a gallbladder or you know a big hernia repair, something like that, okay, those patients are going to go down to the nine foot, eight foot end of the swimming pool. Okay, and all the way to the bottom. Okay, it's a it's a it's a deeper anesthesia. With my facelift patients, 
we're all the way at the other end of the swimming pool, typically sitting on the first step, okay? Just getting in, sitting on the first step, okay? So um, the, other, the other, I was just talking about patients, also like a submarine just under the water, okay? And then I, and I'm, I know everyone else is uses local anesthetic to actually do the procedure, okay? So the face is numb. So my patients, um, they're not paralyzed, they're, they're, they're not talking to me, of course. They're not aware of anything. When I put that first little injection in, they'll turn away from me a little bit sometimes, okay, because they don't like that. So they're, they're, they're still able to move. They're not, they're not paralyzed, okay? And so it's a very, it's essentially a very light anesthetic. And then once it's all over, I say to my uh, anesthetist, okay, wake them up. And really, I do that at the very last second, because as soon as I say wake them up, they're, they're, they're pretty much up. Um, and ready to go. And we really, and the other thing is we were very meticulous in who we select to, to go under anesthesia. So, um, so I, so it typically it's, it's not, it is, it is not as big of an issue as, as it is perceived. Mm -hmm. All right. So in the chat, we had a question, what type of procedures are available for men to accentuate the, and tighten the jawline? So mind. in terms of, yeah, the, I mean, there are, it's largely dependent, I think, for each and every person. Uh, and some men are just not granted from, from God a, a spectacular jawline. They're, they're not a Hemsworth uh, brother. Uh, they're not Brad Pitt. <laughs> they just were never given that, that chiseled look. Uh, and so uh, even still a facelift is a wonderful procedure for restoring a jawline back for men, uh, back to what they once had or similar to ones they once had. Uh, and so that's something that absolutely is a great option uh, for many men. Now, it's not gonna give a Chris Hemsworth jawline if you never had one. Uh, and so that's just something to always remember. Uh, for men as well, uh, some men uh, like to have, uh, filler is always a wonderful option as well for accentuating the jawline. Occasionally, uh, implants to help the angle uh, of the mandible can help add a little bit of volume there uh, and is a procedure I think for men uh, that can uh, do nicely in terms of the jawline. Uh, one thing as well that um, we haven't discussed yet today is actually the importance sometimes of a chin implant um, and how that can help uh, for jawlines in both men and women. Uh, and so for many men and women, their chin is just very small. And for men, you know, you'll often see this, they'll cover it up with a goatee. And so that will help uh, fake volume there. Um, and so one thing that we can do is using that same little incision that goes right underneath the chin, we can add a little implant to the chin itself. That'll add a little bit of volume here and actually create another area where we're volumizing the face. Remember that facial skeleton where we lose all that good volume. Here we're adding back volume to the skeleton. And then by adding that volume, then you're actually pulling the jaw in another direction. So it's a great uh, procedure as standalone uh, with a jaw angle implant or as part of a facelift procedure. Mm -hmm. um, so for men who don't want to undergo surgery, um, the other only other thing that I want to add to that is there is a non-surgical alternative called face tight that I do. And some um, surgeons will carry this, which is a radio frequency assisted procedure, which is to, meant to tighten along the jawline the, for the skin, but also to remove volume that's underneath the jawline. So we can do that with what's called the face tight procedure. So it removes fat or dissolves the fat under the jawline, and then we try to tighten the skin. And then we can add fillers on top as well to accentuate the this angle of, of the mandible that starts to weaken as we age. So there's other things that we can do. And usually if we are looking for a procedure for men who don't wanna have surgery, it may require multiple procedures in one, not just fillers or not just a chin implant. It may require multiple procedures to get the, the outcome that you're looking for. All right, so now we have a Q and A uh, I'm opening up that window. If you haven't submitted your questions yet, we're happy to answer your questions. This is what we're here for. We love answering your questions. At least I'm speaking for myself. And uh, so we had anonymous
person asked, why is it that some of the photos have more defined or sculpted neck versus others that look more subtle? Okay. Dr. Gilbert, do you want to answer that one? Um, yeah, I think that, I think that all, that all, that's something that we always talk about um, with, uh, with my patients. Um, it, it, it certainly depends on the patient and the anatomy of the patient. Um, and um, there are a lot of different, uh, and that's something to discuss uh, with your surgeons. Um, mm -hmm. There are a lot of folks who it really is just patient, um, patient, um, um, what, what they're wanting. I, I have some patients who, who tell me, um, you know, I don't, do not wake me up and uh, my neck not be as absolutely as tight as it can be. And, and that's, that's what we'll do. Some folks just, just say, I really don't want, um, I really don't want it to be that tight. And especially where we are here in the, you know, here in the South, I hear that quite a bit. Um, so I, I, I would say, um, you know, some folks that they're just the patient's anatomy isn't, isn't quite there. Um, and, and others it's, it's, it's patient preference. Yeah. Yeah. So I would agree with Dr. Gilpin there. Anatomy is a huge factor on how the neck will appear. Um, with the position of the high bone, which we like to talk about, this bone is a half circular shape and it's a free floating bone. It does not attach to any other bones. And so it sits in the middle of our neck and for some that bone is a higher, some it's lower in the neck. And then it has muscle attachments to the base of our tongue as well as to the central neck muscles. And it, when you swallow, you can see that move up and down. And it, so it defines the start of your neck and the, it defines the bottom of your chin or where your chin stops. And so if that bone is lower in the neck, which people are just born with that lower position, we can't change that position. Um, not that I know of so far, I don't know that there's a lot of any procedures been discussed for doing so, but that defines how the neck will look. And so if it's more sculpted, it, it may be because the patient already had a well-defined neck in their youth, and then we were able to re return them back there. But if they didn't have a defined neck because the bone was lower in their youth, we won't be able to get them there. And that's why a consultation with myself or Dr. Carnival, Dr. Gilbin is very helpful because we'll be able to assess that and we'll be able to point out what is possible and what's not possible and what you can expect as the outcome. Um, all right, so uh, Dr. Carnival, do you have anything to add? Uh no, it goes, uh, I agree, it largely relates to the patient's underlying anatomy. You know, if you used to have a wonderful jawline, then, then you know, tightening that up uh, may be able to restore a wonderful jawline for you. But again, if you were never someone with a spectacular jawline, or if your neck has just quite fallen in, in those, you know, muscles and the Adam's apple, uh, as Dr. Tanzvati was talking about with the hyoid and the trachea here, um, then those are things where, um, you may not get the that chiseled uh, jawline and that gorgeous kind of neck contour where we talked about that very sharp angle. Um, mm -hmm. However, do I still think that it's worthwhile? And the answer is absolutely yes. You may not get that as the piece that you were, you know, may have been thinking about, but yeah, you know, that, that fold here is a lot better. That jowl here is a lot better. That neck is just a lot tighter. Um, it just looks more youthful. You have that more confidence. And yeah, maybe it wasn't, you know, couldn't achieve that amazing turn, um, but everything else was accomplished. And so absolutely, I think it's a, a wonderful procedure and it's just something to know uh, going into the procedure and have that expectation. Yeah. Yeah. All right, Nat asks, when, <laughs> hi Nat, uh, when do you decide if a patient is a candidate for full facelift or mini facelift? Does somebody want to tackle that one? Ooh, yeah, that's something, that's something we hear quite a bit. Again, yeah. I, would, I, would I think we have to define that first, we right? Have, we because, have to define that, yeah. yeah. And, so I'm going to go ahead and define that for people, and then I'll have you answer. So yeah. full facelift, when we're talking about full facelift, we're talking about the brow, mid face, and the lower face into the neck. That's a full facelift. Um, I think the question here becomes whether we're doing like a traditional or a mini facelift or in our sense, what I describe to my patients, I'm calling it a comprehensive facelift, which means 
mid face, lower face, neck. So it's hard to define for patients because they hear misnomers or they'll hear terms thrown out like a mini facelift. A mini facelift, when I try to describe to patients who ask for it, is it just is a minimal incision, minimal access, minimal whatever it may be. It just means that less, when you say mini, it also means less is done, less incision is created, and so it's a faster downtime. Does it necessarily mean the same result? It depends. Again, the question is it depends. I won't say it's no because a younger patient could have a mini lift or they could have a deep plane and still have a great outcome because their skin is still good quality. But an older patient, I would say, would require a deeper lift. So uh, that's what I would say about, um, he says, you know, when do you decide if a patient's candidate for full face lift or mini face lift? It really, for me, depends on what I'm seeing. Yeah. And I, I think most patients want a, a mini lift uh, because mm -hmm. they're concerned as well about the downtime. Uh, mm -hmm. And uh, Dr. Dilpin was, uh, you know, talked about it. Really, it's in that 10 to 14 day range. Uh, and then people are absolutely kind of sociable uh, at that point, maybe not ready for, um, you know, your wedding photos, but uh, but otherwise sociable, out and about, uh, ready to go uh, greet people again. Um, so I think that's, you know, important thing to consider with the full face lift. Um, but I think when we talk about mini lift, then traditionally, you know, many of us are talking about things that are done in the office without uh, general anesthesia. Uh, and I agree for with Dr. Chen's body. It can mean uh, a wonderful result, but it's overall less. So uh, in my hands, we're not going to be able to get the amazing tightening in the neck with a mini lift. We're just not able to do that because that type of thing uh, it just entails a little bit more of a procedure and generally a little bit more anesthesia uh, to accomplish those goals. And so that's really where, you know, if there's tremendous folds that are here, those things are really probably not going to be addressed quite as much as you might like. Uh, with a quote mini lift as opposed to a more full lift. Okay, what do you think, Dr. Gilpin? I, I agree with everything. It's the the mini lift is also more of a it's a is it's a exactly what Dr. Turner says. It's mini it's a mini procedure, and um, I don't do a whole lot of mini lifts because I don't I don't have a not not as many. I really don't have a lot of great candidates for it. And for me to do that, I had someone come in the other day who wanted you know rejuvenation with fillers and, and Botox, which those are fabulous things. But I said, what you, what you need is a, uh, a face and neck lift and, and a brow lift. And that's actually what we ended up doing. And she, she's very happy. Um, yeah, I, I just, it just really depends on the patient. If, if the, the patient and the anatomy, if all that is needed is just a mini t um, lift or tuck up, and I think that's appropriate, but um, for those, if it's, it's, we need to do more, I just have that conversation with them. You may not get everything that you, that you want. Right. Well, I'm going to just share my screen again for purposes of just um, going over this. Uh, I just want to share with that last patient that I um, did with her lips. This was a modified deep plane lift. So I pretty much do a deep plane for a majority of my patients. Just, I just love doing a deep plane lift because it just looks more natural. But what I'll say is when you when we talk about a mini lift and people are looking for less downtime, then what I can do sometimes is just modify it. Meaning I don't do all of this section because a deep plane lift will try to release all of the tendons, the attachments, right? So we'll take the mandibular cutaneous ligament, the zygomatico cutaneous ligament, which is up higher. If I don't need to move their mid face, I won't do this um, uh, release here. So I will just focus on this lower portion. So if you are looking for a mini lift, I typically will say, you know, I, I feel that that's more of a sales term. Um, what you're looking for is you're looking for less recovery, faster recovery, and um, less being over pulled or whatever that might look like. So what I normally tell my patients then is I can do what's called a modified lift. So that means I just address the main area, do less dissection, and you're still going to get what you were thinking of for a mini facelift. But I won't term it a mini facelift. 
So that's how I change what I do. But yeah, this patient was able to recover within two weeks. This is her picture is at one month. So that yeah. shows you that recovery can be fast. Yeah. All right. All right. Thank you so much for that question, Nat. Um, are there any other questions? It's kind of been, um, we're trying to uh, address everybody's fears because I think that's one of the biggest things that I have when patients come in asking for what they can do for their face or neck. The first thing they ask is, what non-surgical options do I have? They're, they feel that they're not ready to have surgery. That's right. <laughs> uh, thank you for that comment in the chat window. It was, thank you, hurry up and reopen. <laughs> we really want to reopen. We do, we all of us do. And that's why we're providing this information for all of you today, because we find that whatever we can do to be helpful to give you the information you need while we're coping at home. Um, we're going to do that for you guys until we're ready to come back and hit the ground running. All right. So uh, we have one another question before we close. It says, what are the most worrisome possible complications that could happen or you've had to deal with and what percentage could experience these complications? So the most worrisome for me for what, when I go through the consent, I'll tell you, is face, facial nerve injury. So the paralysis and the asymmetry to the face is probably the most worrisome. Even though the rate is so low in my patients, whenever I get it, of course, it keeps me up at night as well, because it's not fun to be walking around with a distorted face where one side is paralyzed, maybe at the corner of the lip, or this upper lip here. And it can happen, it happens to the best of us. Um, I've never had a permanent injury, they all go away with time, um, but they can happen. And so that's probably one of the most worrisome possible complications that could happen. And I have had to deal with it. So I'll tell you, you know, it's for me, it keeps me up for the first few weeks. I do have a protocol that I approach. So by the second week after they've healed pretty well, I put them on steroids. Uh, to help decrease any swelling that might be around the nerve to help them heal. Uh, and then it's just more about hand holding and allowing them to do um, uh, lymphatic drainage massage to help with swelling, as well as moving their muscles to get that firing to happen. And other than that, it is watchful waiting. Most of the times um, they come back by five or six weeks and I don't really need to do anything. Um, sometimes it could be a little bit longer, but usually it's starting to show some motion that I can see. And so then we just, I say, you see that, that that's just starting right there. It's, it's coming back. You just have to bear with it with me. If you feel numbness in your face, it's going to be the same trajectory. So if that numbness is still there, that nerve that's for the motor muscle, is still not going to be coming back completely yet until you feel like everything's back. So it is, it is hard to, to have to do that with patients, but uh, it's all about um, managing those expectations and letting the patients know, hey, we've got this, this can happen, it's temporary, and it will go away. Yes. Oh, percentage. Somebody asked about percentage. The percentage of that is less than 1% of cases. Yeah. The, and then, the data that I quote is in uh, one percent of patients they'll have some sort of temporary uh, or permanent uh, facial nerve issues, and uh, in ninety percent of those they'll recover uh, within a, you know definitely within the year. Um, that's just the the data from that study. Uh, and so the final uh, percentage that we talk about is zero point one percent as the risk. So that's one in a thousand uh, as the risk of some sort of permanent nerve injury like that. Very good. All right, so this last uh, question, I think this is time to wrap it up. Um, why don't we go ahead and type our answers here for everybody to see. Uh, how can somebody make a virtual consultation with us? And so um, I'm just gonna put my Instagram handle for those to see. And I'm gonna ask you guys too, if you guys could post that, Oop, maybe in the chat window. Oh, perfect. Uh Look at you. I beat you to it, Christina. I, I decided to load it up a, a slide for us all. Oh, thank yeah. you. Oh, wow. Oh, Dr. Carnell's always had us beat, you know? 
Yes. I just I'm just trying to be helpful today as this was uh, uh, wonderful to, to be a guest on it again. So this is great. Yes. Well, I am so thankful to have both of you as amazing colleagues. And I just want to thank both of you for joining me today for this webinar, for all of our patients and for future patients, because we're going to be putting this on our YouTube channels and our uh, social media channels for everybody to see later. So um, thank you everybody for uh, joining us today. Do you want to put any parting words, Dr. Gilpin or Dr. Carnial? Yes, I would just, yes. I would like to say thank you to Dr. Tanzavati for inviting me today. This has been wonderful. And thank you to all uh, the, the um, attendees uh, for participating and for your questions. That's, that's really great. Um, I'm just going to type an answer. Um, somebody. Do you have anything to add, Dr. Carniel? Uh, Dr. Tanzavati, thank you again for having me. No, it's, uh, it's a tough time, I know, for all of us as this uh, crisis is uh, continuing, and I know that uh, it's getting very tempting uh, in many states that as things are starting to reopen slowly, um, and we all just have to remember that we've, we've been doing the hard work in, in, in keeping everybody safe, and that should just continue uh, as we you know, start to do things that kind of make common sense uh, mm -hmm. in opening slowly. And so I know uh, for everyone that's uh, in California and Tennessee and, and New Jersey and New York, you know, we're all at different speeds of this and different, and it's impacted us all even still a little bit differently in every state. Uh, and so we just have to you know, continue to be good to one another. Uh, and we know that we will all open up again uh, and we will be seeing patients and we will be ready for everyone, uh, mm -hmm. but we'll need to see everybody in uh, a little bit of a more spaced out fashion than I think we used to, uh, which yeah. I think overall will be a good thing. Yeah. So I, I want to say thank you, Dr. Sormi, for joining. I see his name and uh, hopefully you will be opening here very soon as well. And I just want to say thank you to everybody. We are going to have another webinar next week. Stay tuned for information about what that webinar will be. Um, I know some people have asked about FaceTime, and actually that is going to be presented on Monday. So if you are here and you just asked about the FaceTime and I mentioned it, you had questions, tune in on Monday. Uh, the posted time will come up shortly through our email. If you haven't signed up for a newsletter, go to our website and you could easily sign up for the newsletter at the bottom of the screen. It will say the information to add. You can also sign up just by going to my Instagram handle and you will find information on how to sign up for a newsletter there. Um, and we will be posting on Instagram too for the next webinar. Do you guys want to join me for another webinar? Absolutely. All I'm right. Ready. Okay. We're having this happen again. All right. Bye everybody. Thanks for joining. Thanks for Have joining. a great day. Thank you.